Hello class. So today what we're going to talk about is global sensitivity analysis. A lot of what we've been discussing has been about the local properties of sensitivities, right? So local sensitivities are derivatives. They tell you how functions change in a very, I mean, in an in infinitesimal sense, right? Um, but in a lot of cases, you want to know how things change over a wide range of parameters. So like, you know, how do you do a, how would you make a statement like on average, um, the output of my simulator's first component goes up when I change uh, parameter two over the domain of parameters that I care about, right? So how can you make a good determination of things like that? And also things like, um, you know, the, the variance explained by, you know, over changes in parameters, the variance of the second output's out changes can be explained as due to interactions between very, uh, parameters two and three, right? So if you want to change, if you if you want to know what actually affects output two, it's the, the only real things that change it is when you change two and three together, parameters two and three together, right? How can you make these kinds of refined statements over large large areas, right? Because the the gradients tell you what happens at a specific point, right? So at a parameters P, you get the gradient and that tells you the output will be changing um, with respect to the parameters like this. But how do you how do you do this in a more general sense? And that's what the global sensitivity analysis is all about. Um, so global sensitivity analysis is used a lot in a lot in fields where you care about you know making inference from models where you don't necessarily trust everything about your model. Um, so it's kind of back in in the same sphere as scientific machine learning, where you say I'm allowed to you know discover my model, and then after I kind of learn what an approximate model is. I want to make inference from it. I want to be able to tell someone that, you know, the right way to control the population is to, you know, is, is to increase the number of wolves instead of decreasing the number of rabbits, right? Like these kinds of statements about how we should be affecting ecological systems, how we should be affecting pharmaceutical, you know, pharm pharmacometrical systems, um, all of these kinds of systems are analyzed through global sensitivity analysis methods. So what we're gonna go through today is exactly how do you do these computations, right? Um, so there, there are libraries that you can use. So for example, if you look at globalsensitivity.jl, you'll find documentation that shows you how to make use of all sorts of global sensitivity analysis methods. Um, and, and so you can kind of, today, if you want to, you can take one of these one of these libraries and get global, do global sensitivity analysis, do it in a way that's automatically parallelized across whole supercomputers. But you should really have an understanding of how these methods work in order to know their limitations and know the current research that's going on in this field. So global, uh, the setup for global sensitivity analysis is that we have a function f, you know, so this, this function f is our model, right? It could be um, a ordinary differential equation solver, like what shows up in a lot of our cases. Um, and what we want to do is we under, want to understand the relationship at y equals f of xi, where xi are some inputs. There's just a bunch of them, and you want to know how an output changes with respect to an input. Um, so like in the ODE solver sense, like f can be the ODE solver, and all of these xi include things like the initial conditions and the input parameters to the solver. And what we want to know is how to reflect those changes, the total changes in Y, back to changes in these inputs to our simulator. Um, now, this is too broad of a definition to actually be able to do any mathematics on. So we need to kind of phrase it in another sense. And um, global sensitivity analysis then needs to at least do one thing, right? You at least need to define the domain on which what parameters or what inputs you care about. Because technically, if you don't do that, then you know you have to consider the case of what is the change in x as x goes to infinity and things like that. But what we really care about is you know um, the reaction rate for uh, you know glycophase or something against another protein um, is between. 3 to 300, right? So what may, maybe there's an order of magnitude that we don't know in there. So over that order of magnitude, how does our model change, right? Those are the kinds of questions we want to answer. And so you need to be putting a bound on your parameters. That's like the key input to any of these, um, any of these methods. Now, for global sensitivity analysis to be well-defined in a mathematical sense, we need to have 
some way to be able to talk about the whole space of parameters, right? So we need to be able to talk about the likeliness of having a parameter, you know, x at 10 versus x equals 1, right? And so the way to think about this is that f um, in global sensitivity analysis is a deterministic program with probabilistic inputs. And we want to be able to relate the outputs uh, the distribution of the outputs to distributions of the input, right? We, we want to be able to come up with um, a way to reflect the different the 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 parameters that define the input pro uh, distributions, and use those input distribution parameters to tell us what is true about the output distributions parameters, right? So we want to know things like how does the mean or how does the variance of the outputs distribution change with ref with respect to input distribution parameters. And so the main reason why we do global sensitivity analysis is because in a lot of cases you cannot trust your model well enough to know that you, know, you have the right parameters. So if you don't know if you have the right parameters, you can't necessarily just take a gradient to be able to tell you how things change. You need to kind of have a, a more general sense, right? You need to have a probabilistic sense of how things change. So let's start digging into um, some global sensitivity methods to see how they kind of work. So the first set of methods which are used for global sensitivity methods or global sensitivity analysis is a, the set of linear methods, right? So assume that you have a linear model, um, y equals ax, right? If you're to do y, if you're to have y equals ax as your model, um, the way to be able, to, if you had a bunch of data that related y back to and y and x, what you would do to be able to find the relationship of outputs y to inputs x is you'd use linear regression, right? So you'd say that I have outputs y and I have inputs xi. There's a beta coefficient on each of these. And linear regression is the standard thing that would tell you how, what are the coefficients beta i such that I can map from the xi back to y, right? Um, so if you had a linear model, then you can actually show that linear regression is supposed to give you exactly the coefficients that return the um, that re return the equations, right? So this is the um, the proof of the non-unbiasedness of the OLS estimator. Um, so so to actually be able to, to actually be able to do this in practice, right? Um, we want to be normally using nor uh, our normalized data. So we we want to kind of get rid of these effects of um, of units, and we want to get rid of effects of you know different size scales and scaling sizes. So what we want to do is we want to um, come up with a quantity that is essentially unitless that tells us the percentage of y's changes um, as an effect or due to changes in x, right? And this is what's usually known as the r squared co coefficient. Um, so first what we do is we normalize our data. So we would say you know, x tilde is equal to, well, you subtract off the mean and you divide by the variance, right? So everything is ter in terms of z-scores, and then you do z-scores for y. And in, in, inside of the z-score area, right, so we're looking at z-scores of y against z-scores of x, um, what, you would, what you would do then is that you would notice that the beta sub i, they capture the mean, uh, mean effect. So essentially, you know, the variance of y equals the sum of the beta squared times i times uh, variance of x i's, right? Which means that uh, so, so yeah, so so this this should actually be saying that um, the variance of y equals the sum over equals the sum over i of the variance of x i. Um, this is beta sub i squared, right? So how do how do you get that formula? Well, what you do is you take the sorry, you take the um, the equation y equals you know, the sum over beta over i beta sub i um, x i, and what you do then is you do the variance of both sides. The variance of y equals the sum, or the variance of the sum over i beta i x i. You make an assumption of, about um, you have to make an assumption here about the correlations, um, you know, cor uh, having some zero correlations between your input variables. And so then if after that assumption, you can move this um, summation outwards. So if you look up the, um, the, the, um, 
properties of variance, you'll see that you know this is a relationship that you can swap with the sum if you also get rid of the, the correlation terms. So you say that beta i, this is beta i x i, and then to pull a scalar out of the variance, remember that you have to square it. And so that's how you get to the formula that's right here. Right. So we're, we're basically assuming that there's no cor correlations between you know x i and x j, which you know if there might be correlations in your data set, and you you might want to take in, in those into account, um, but th that's not what this model right now is doing, right? So or this this method. So for for this method, what you do is then you say, well, what is the percentage of the variation that is due to um, that is due to changing x i? Well, if if you if you only cared about if you only changed x i, right? So if you want to like look at well, what if what happens if I'm only looking at the the changes of um, of y due to x i? Then I'm just going to be looking at this one term. And if I look at this one term, what I can do is I can get um, you know v of x i um, over uh, v of y. Then I can uh, square root that, right? Like th so this this is essentially you know if if you were to take the or sorry let's move this to the other side well let's let's uh so let's do it like this so we do sum over i not equal to j um this and then we have the j term right But let's say we want to find out the percentage of the variation that's due to j. Well, what we do is we, we can move this over, or we, we can, we can uh, divide by here. So then we'd say that you know, the, the total percentage of the variance is going to be 1. And so we have um, beta sub, uh, let's see, so beta sub j squared. And then we have you know, variance of x sub j. Right, a uh, variance of y. Oh, and, uh, let, let, let's say we do this for all terms. It might be easier to do it like this. So, in some sense, um, what this is telling us is that, you know, if we, and then we can take the square root of both sides, but essentially what this is saying is that, you know, when, when we're looking at the normalized variables, the, the percentage of the total. Um, variance that is due to a term is due to the ratio of the variance uh, of one term divided by um, the total variance, um, and, and the scaling factor is this beta. Or you can look at it in terms of the standard deviation, and when you look at it in terms of the standard deviation, you take the square root of this quantity, which is where the um, which is where the beta scaling comes out. Right. So so this is the SRC coefficient, which is essentially um, saying you know the standard deviation of the output that is due to that is due to changes in input i is is due to you know that you take the variance in you take the variance in the x i term from the data you take the variance of the y term from the data and then you take the square root of that and then you multiply it by the beta that comes out of uh, out of regression and that gives you kind of like an estimate of what percentage of the output changes are due to x i you know, and you could do uh, what are the percentage of the output changes due to x, you know, xj, and you, then you can start to look at you know what happens when you don't drop off the co correlation terms and you keep the covariance terms, and you can have the CC co uh, the correlation coefficients, which tells you what percentage of the output is due to the correlation between xi and xj, right? Um, so, so, and then, you know, partial correlation coefficients is another such measure. But essentially all these measures are, is you, you do a linear regression and then you define um, results based off, of, you define methods based off of this linear regression. So how does that work on a nonlinear model? Well, what you, what you can do with the nonlinear model is you can say y equals f of xi, right? Like, so here I have inputs into a simulator and I have outputs coming from a model. I can build a data set, right? So I can have a data set, which is, um, uh, let me just call this x now. I can build a data set, which is like, you know, x, y pairs for, you know, each j term of the data set. 
And then what I can do is you can do a linear regression to find, you know, linear regression to find an approximating uh, linear model to the simulator, right? It's not necessarily always going to be good, but, um, you know, you can do that, right? So you can find the linear regression, and then you can say things like, on average, increasing xi increases yi. Because, and why would you know that? Well, because beta is positive, right? And if beta is negative, then on average, increasing um, uh, xi will decrease y, right? And that's what this linear regression is going to tell you. It's going to tell you over all the, all of the points that you sampled, where you take sample a bunch of parameters from your space, you then get samples of what, what your yj to, to have to build your data set. After doing this linear regression, you have a, a, a sense of a global sensitivity. And these, co and these correlation coefficients, or you know, the SRC, these give you some percentage values that kind of tell you what percentage of the simulation changes are due to the change in parameter i. Now, this is a nice and easy method. Um, it's fairly simple to just do a linear regression, use these formulas, and now you have a method where you can say, if SRC of j is you know, almost zero, that means that the solution of the ordinary differential equation is not very dependent on parameter j, right? Like, that's how you can make, you know, and you could say that in a global sense, right? So for any possible parameters, you know, the solution of the ordinary differential equation is not very dependent on the input parameter j. You can change it as much as you want. That's not the thing that is changing the output or what the, what I'm measuring about the output. So while it is a very simple method and it can make statements like this, you need to watch out for issues with nonlinearity, right? So, um, for example, if you try to do a linear regression and your data points follow a, a quadratic, you might just draw a line that is horizontal through the quadratic. And so then you say beta equals zero because it's going negative and then it goes positive. But, um, of course, that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, the, the changes in y are not due to, you know, it doesn't make sense to say that x does not change y at all. What you mean is that x starts by decreasing y and then it increasing y, but that's not a statement that you can make with a linear model, right? So you can start to do tricks, like you can do a regression where your data points can be the x squareds or something, and you can then very similarly make statements about, you know, what is the variance explained due to x squared. But linear methods will always have some kind of caveats that you have to handle in, in, in many ways. So a lot of the methods for global sensitivity method analysis understand the, the, the core ideas of the, of the linear methods, but no longer require linearity. So uh, the, one of the first methods along these lines is derivative-based uh, global sensitivity measure, right? So um, what you can do is you can say, uh, you know, the, the local sensitivity measure is the derivative. So how do you compute averages? Well, an average in a mathematical sense is an integral. So if I want to compute the average overall derivatives, what I can do is I can do the um, what I can do is the uh, the average in the integral sense um, to calculate the average derivative over the whole parameter space. Right, so that's what this is doing. So vi is you know some some the average. So this, the variance right is uh, is the expected value squared. So the expected value, the derivative squared, which is calculated by doing the integral of the derivative squared over the whole space, where f of x is some probability distribution over your parameters. Right, so if you know the probability of having specific parameters and you can calculate derivatives everywhere. This gives you a clear formula for how do you get the average variance um, of the output with, you know, where what you have to do at every single point in space is you, you, you take a point in your parameter space. This f of x is the probability of having that point. Um, this f of x is the, um, the solution, you know, y that comes out of the ODE solver. And so we then you take the, the derivative of that with respect, you take the derivative of the solution with respect to your input, right? So this is using the adjoint method or using for uh, finite different or finite differences or forward sensitivity analysis, right? You take that, square it, multiply there, and then you do the integral of that quantity over all of space. Um, 
and that tells you what the the variance in the output so the you know how much of the output is changing due to an input x and you can do this for each xi and you can also do a mean measure right so um how much how much does the average um how much does the you know oh, so so okay so this this is the um expected the the expected value of the square and then you can do just the expected value and the square of that and then there's a classic formula that the variance is computed by um this quantity minus this quantity squared let me let me show that um so okay so so we have that um you know the, the variant so oh, so we have that the expected value of um of x minus mu squared this is e this is uh, equal to the variance of x right so let's let's show uh, let's show another formula here what we can do is we can expand out um so we have x squared minus uh, mu x uh, plus uh, mu squared Right, where actually let me write this as expected value of x itself. I believe I'm missing a term here. Let me think real second. Um, God, for some reason I'm having trouble remembering how to foil. It's just one of those things where we're recording a video, right? Um, do 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 do. So the term here should end up uh, actually canceling to zero. I'm trying to remember. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that uh, of trying to trying to remember. But essentially, what happens is you you have a way to cancel the middle term here, and you get this expression, which is that you have the expected value of x squared um, minus the expected value of x squared. Right. So the way that you get the first one is you leave it in the expectation. This is a a scalar, right? Because you've already taken an expected value, so you can just pull out the scalar, and that's where this term comes from. Um, Let's see, but I'm I'm missing a minus sign somewhere. Oh yeah, so so um now now I remember, yeah. So so now you have this minus two x, right? Which uh so so let me do this step by step. So I pull you this term becomes the expected value of x squared. This term is a scalar, so you pull it out. The middle term is minus two expected value of x uh Expected value of x, expected value of x. This is a scalar, so you pull it out. And oh, hey, look, we have um, expected value of x and expected value of x. So this is the expected value of x squared. And so you have two expected value of x squared plus expected value of x squared. And so then you have e of x squared uh, minus e of x squared, right? So this is another way of writing down the variance. So what you can do is you can calculate the expected value of the squares, and then you can calculate the expected value and square it. And when you subtract those two quantities, you have the global. You, you have an estimate for the variance. Um, so here's a way to be able to, you know, straightforwardly use your local sensitivity analysis with a direct averaging approach to be able to give a global sensitivity measure. Um, and it's really nice because it can make use of everything that you've done with adjoints, um, but it is kind of something that's expensive. Um, so there are other methods that people have come up with. Now, one thing that you can think about is ADVI is a measurement for global sensitivity, right? Because th this whole issue is how do you come up with a probability distribution for Y given the probability distribution of XI? And in the, prob in the probabilistic programming lecture, what I described is that ADVI is a method for finding the distribution of y with respect to, you know, um, as a function of parameters that describe the input distribution. So ADVI is also a straightforward method for, um, for doing this.
But the methods that people generally use for, for global sensitivity analysis is a kind of another set. So I want to make sure I spend the time on these ones. So one of the one of the nice ones is the Morris one at a time method. So instead of using differences, what you can do is use finite difference approximation. And um, now, normally we say that we don't want to use finite difference approximations because um, because well because you need to when taking a derivative you have to take delta x very small. And or or else you know you're not in the limit and you don't have the local sensitivity, and when you take delta x equals very small, then you have uh, then you have numerical issues that show up. So so you know you it, x has to be small enough to to be a correct calculation of the derivative, but it needs to be large enough to not have um, to not have numerical issues, and so that's why finite differencing isn't generally used. But when you're doing global sensitivity analysis. Why would you not use it, right? Because what you want is you want to understand what happens on average for your gradients. And one way to, on average, get gradients is to use delta x's that are not going to zero. And so if your delta x is large enough, then you don't necessarily have those numerical issues that make you not want to use finite differences. So Morris, the Morris one at a time method really uses the what is generally seen as the disadvantages for finite differencing for local sensitivity analysis it uses that as the advantage for getting a nice method for global sensitivity analysis um, and, and the way to you do the Morris method is actually fairly straightforward you take a point and then you randomly choose an i and you know and then what you do is you say oh I chose like three um, so you, you you give you give yourself equal probabilities of choosing each of the i's. And then um, you randomly do, you you choose what you do is you do a delta x change in only that one direction, right? And then you calculate the derivative of approximation, right? Because what what, what you do is you calculate you know, f of x uh, plus delta x minus f of x divided by uh, divided by delta x. Right, and, and here I'm going to say that this is delta x i because you know this is a delta x which is only in the i direction, and it can also be different sizes in the different directions if your parameter space is like narrower in some. Right, but okay, so so you choose to move in in the direction x i, and then you choose to move in the direction x j. Right, so so what you can do then is you can say. Um, if, if you do this over the space, you'll have a bunch of places randomly in your space where you've done a, a line where you only change one parameter. So, you know, when, when P1, when parameter 1 is small and parameter 3 is small, you've only changed parameter 2. When parameter 3 is big and parameter 1 is big, you have a spot where you've only changed parameter 2, right? And kind of all over the place, you, you have these kind of isolated areas where you've done this computation of when I only change two, what is the change in the output? So for this, what you, what you can do then is you can say I have a lot of measures of you know one one at a time changes, and they're kind of spread out over my whole space, right? Because you know you're kind of walking, changing one parameter at a time. In some sense, you're creating a nice walk over all parameters. Um, so so you you've now sampled in like a, a, a nice way all of your parameters globally. Um, and uh, with, with that, you can say, well, what is the average change that I'm actually seeing over all of space? Now, there's one little trick that you get to do with this, right? Because you could also say, I'm going to do a finite difference everywhere in space. So why do this walking strategy? Well, the reason is because if you do a finite difference method at each point in space, you know, um, kind of randomly sampling around, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do two F calculations. Morse method is pretty smart because it's going to have exactly half of the calculations. And the way that it does that, you know, let's say you change parameter one the first time. Um, so, so you have x1 and x2, where x2 is only different from x1 in parameter one, right? Now let's say you change parameter two the second time, and you have x, f of x2, and you have f of x3, where the, the only difference between them is the second parameter, right? But here, if you're actually to do the, the, the finite difference approximations, you know, the change in parameter 1 would be f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by you know, delta and x1. 
And the change in parameter, in parameter 2 is going to be just f of x3 minus f of x2 um, divided by uh, delta x2. Right? And so you actually can reuse this function evaluation. right? So every function evaluation, except for the start and end ones, are going to be reused in two different finite difference approximations. And so because of that, you kind of get a lot more computational efficiency out. You, know, you, you, have, you use half the number of computations in order to get this average uh, view of, the, of your finite differences. And so the, the Morris method is a widely used method for kind of getting an average sample of output changes, um, you know, like an average derivative, right? And it's doing this with a non-zero, non-vanishing non um, delta x because it doesn't need to be vanishing, right? It's not calculating a derivative. In some sense, it's, it wants to average in all these changes over larger regions. And so using sufficiently large delta x's is fine. Um, so um, to... to now, there, for practical reasons, you actually need to do a few changes to this. To this. So one thing that you can notice is that um, all the positive changes in f and the negative changes in f will cancel out. Right. So you'll naively say that, you know, let's say you, you have a bunch of positive changes and a bunch of negative changes, then you can might end up saying that, you know, uh, the parameter one does not have a large effect on the output, when in reality it just had lots of positive and negative changes. So in practice, what you do when you're doing when you're calculating the Morris coefficients is you take all of the absolute values of them to be able to tell you what is the absolute changes in y with respect to um, with respect to this input quantity, and that gives you like an average sense of you know what what values are causing changes in your output. Um, another thing that that needs to be done too is you need to make sure that your walk is not degenerate, right? What do I mean by that? Well, technically, your walk can keep on going around in circles and stay near the origin of your of your um, of your space, right? Like it might just kind of go around, around, around. Whereas, like a good walk would be one that kind of you know very explores your parameter range, so that way you have these finite differences which are kind of all over the place, and you know so you're averaging with all these different quantities around. So what you generally do um, with the Morris method is you, you, you calculate the geometric distances between all pairs of points, and then you make sure you generate, um, you, you generate multiple trajectories. So you do, you do this for many different trajectories, and you remove the trajectories which do not have large, um, which do not have this large distances between its points, because that tells you you kind of stayed in one region, right, randomly. And so you, if you if you do like ten different trajectories, you know you'll you'll have some spiral around. You'll have some just kind of stay in one spot. You use this geometric distance to be able to remove the ones that that, that didn't work out well, and you only do the average over the trajectories that that did do large walks. Um, one nice thing about this is that doing different trajectories is parallel, right? So you can do a hundred trajectories all at the same time, and then you can then average average all the solutions afterwards. And so you, you might have to be doing a hundred thousand or a million ODE solves, but you might be doing, you know, 10,000 of them at a, at a time. So the Morris one out of time method is really nice because it's really straightforward. And I mean, you can implement it by hand and, you know, in, in 15 to 20 minutes, um, but it doesn't have like a rigorous probability basis. and also doesn't tell you about interaction coefficients, right? It doesn't tell you about things like how the changes in x1 and x2 together cause overall changes. Um, and so when we want to go to something more sophisticated, what people generally do is you use Sobel's method. The Sobel's method is essentially an analysis of variance or analysis of variation on nonlinear models. And, and so for Sobel's method, what you, what you do is you say, um, right, so you say, you know, y, which is my output, is a function f of x. But what it, it really is, is there's a, um, there, there, there is a part that is constant, right? And then there are parts that are, where, where what I do is I define this x of i as like, the, the expected value due to, you know, the expected value and the expected changes due to input one, uh, only, you know, input i, right? And you have that, that expected change due to input i for every single input. And then you have the expected change 
um, due to combinations of i and j for every single input i and j, right? So now this is, you know, what is the expected change of the output with respect to um, changes i and j is a function of two inputs. And so what you can do is you can do what's known as the Sobel decomposition, where you can then write down, you know, that th this decomposition saying that um, in a probabilistic sense, another way to represent f of x is, well, if I, if I do the integral of f of x over the whole, over all parameters, um, this is some kind of constant term. And by orthogonality, you have that, you know, the, by orthogonality, what I mean here is that if you do something like um, integral of f sub i, of x sub i, um, f sub j, of x sub j, uh, dx i, dx j, you can actually show that all these these integrals come out to zero. Um, and, and what you then get is the, you get these definitions. So you get that uh, f sub i x sub i is equal to the expected value of y given x sub i, right? So what is, so, so what expected value of y given x sub i, this would be what happens when you, you, you fix a value of x sub i, and then you take the integral over all other parameters, and that tells you, uh, uh, that, t that tells you what the expected value of y is given a choice of xi, right? So, um, what you can show is that you know th this term fi is can be defined as the expected value of y given xi subtract out the constant changes in y um, that just happen overall, right? And then you have your next syllable term, which is so th this should make sense in, in a second here. So f sub i j x sub i x sub j equals the expected value of y given x sub i, x sub j, um, subtract off all of your previous terms. Subtract off um, the, the constant term, and then subtract off the first index terms. Um, and then dot, dot, dot. You, you, you can define the, the third term, the fourth term, the fifth term, all using the same pattern. So you can show then, if you use this definition, or if you use these definitions for the fi's and fj's, you can always rewrite f of x in terms of these for any of your input probability distributions. Now, the reason why you do this is because let's say you, we want to take the variance of both sides of the equation, right? So what we can so what we do is you do the variance of both sides of the equation. So you have the variance of y equals the variance of f of x, uh, which equals the variance of f sub zero, which, oh, that's that's a constant. So the variance of a constant is zero. Um, so this is going to be the sum of vi plus the sum of the vij's, right? Where this is the, or let me write this out, the variance of f sub i x sub i, right? And the variance of um, f sub i j, x sub i, x sub j, Right, and these are what we then call the the um, Sobel indices or the Sobel variances. Um, so this is the sum over i all of the first variances plus the second variations, and so on and so forth. Right, and L dots. Right. So um, what 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 these other so I mean essentially this definition needs to be that this is the variance of f of i, you know variance of f of i. Another way of writing this is that the variance, the i -th variance term is the variance of the expected value of x. Um, so x uh, w the expected value of x without changing value. So the expected value of x sans the value i. So without changing i y given x sub i, right? And, and the why is this the x without changing i? Well, because remember in this definition that we use the expected value of y given x i, which is fix the value of x i and do the integral over all other values, right? So that's where this kind of fancy, like do the expectation where you don't, aren't changing the ith term is coming from because you're doing the variance over a term that is defined by fixing the value x i.
and so then you have the vijs and everything as well um so so the actual the actual definition of sobol gets kind of complex but what you can do in the end is you can say well the s of i is the fraction of the variance which is due to the ith input and so so uh, you have the Sobel second indices, which is Sij, which is the fraction of the input or the fraction of the variance that is due to the interaction between uh, input i and input j. And all these have well-defined uh, meanings in terms of these vi and vij terms. These are the Sobel indices that a lot of people care about. Now, the other thing that you care about is the Sobel total index, which is called the total index i here which is the expected value over changing everything but parameter i of the variance of y. Right? So these definitions, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. It'll take time to really understand them. But um, essentially what it, what it means is the, the solvable total index gives you a way to measure the, the solvable total index for i is essentially uh, 1 minus... It, it, it's a measurement for, like, let, let me, the, the total index of i is, is essentially some kind of you know, vi plus the sum over j, vij plus, right? So it's adding all of these um, terms that have i in there. So it's like, you know, it, with every, everything else that's, that's changing the output, if we consider every way that i is affecting the output, what is the total output? And that's the so we'll total index of the i uh, of, uh, of the i. Right. So all we need to do in order to do Sobel's sensitivity analysis is we need to be able to calculate a lot of these expected values. And then if we can calculate the expected values, we can get the variance due to the i term. And then we can take the, the percentage of the variance explained um, as just the ratios of these VIs. And so Sobel uh, sensitivity analysis is all about calculating these, um, these quantities. Now, to make this be computationally tractable, what you need to do is you need to take very large integrals over very large spaces, right? So, um, right, so remember that this is the integral, or, or at least this term, the, these VIs, this is the integral over, you know, everything except i. So if you have 10 parameters, these expected values are defined in terms of integrals over nine-dimensional spaces. So you need to be able to take high dimensional integrals. And, and so standard methods like Gaussian quadrature do not, special, do not scale very well to those spaces. So you kind of need to use Monte Carlo methods. But instead of standard Monte Carlo methods, you make use of something called a quasi Monte Carlo method. Um, and what a quasi Monte Carlo method is, is it's a low discrepancy speed sequence, which essentially means that um, it spaces out the terms such that they kind of capture different parts of space. But it doesn't do it like a grid method, right? So, for example, if you're to have n points in every direction and you have a nine-dimensional space, then a grid-based method would take n to the ninth points. And so if you just have 100 points in, you know, in each direction, uh, 100 to the ninth, you'd have to do 100 to the ninth power um, solves of your ODE solver in order to actually compute this integral. And you need to then do that for, you know, 10 different times for the 10 different variation terms. And so you can see how that can get interactively fast, right? So for high dimensional spaces, you don't want to ever use grid points. That, that has something called, you know, um, well, that, that, that suffers from the curse of dimensionality. So instead, there are things called um, low discrepancy sequences. One that's used a lot in Sobel, uh, in Sobel analysis is called the well, the Sobel sequence, which the logo discrepancy sequence looks like this. But I think one that, that kind of makes more intuitive sense to me is the Latin hypercube. The Latin hypercube is, is a generalization of the Latin square. Um, so the Latin square, let me kind of just pull one up. Not a Latin square, sorry. Um, Latin square. So Latin square, where, where's an example of one? Yeah, so Latin square is one of these objects where it's like you only have the value one in this column or row. Right? You only have the, uh, the value one show up one time here. You only have the value one show up one time here. Right? So you kind of put together this thing so that way one only shows up in each direction one at a time. 
um, a Latin hypercube is in, you know, it, it, you, you can divide up your space in kind of like the, this, this DX-ish kind of thing. But instead of trying to have every single grid point, what you're trying to say is that along the line, you want to have only one value that is, you know, you want to only have one value of Y that is hitting that line. And you want to do this in every dimension, right? So, so it, it's just like the Latin hypercube, where you're like, you only want to hit one here, and you only want to hit one in each dimension. You only want to hit, hit one in each dimension. And so, what you can show then is that you know each line, uh, you you're you're sampling over this very large space, um, and and in any given line that you throw in the axis direction, you're going to be hitting a point that you sampled on, but you aren't making it densely packed on every single grid line. You know, not every single intersection is going to have one exactly one direction in each of the directions, right? So it's essentially this Latin hypercube, except in a very large space. Um, so so that, that's that's the Latin hypercube method where you can, where you kind of build this scatter plot where um, it's it's the amount of points that you need is not is is not um, a function of the dimensionality. So you can say, I want 200 points in nine dimensions, but it will kind of divide up the space such that you have a good chance in any given chunk of space of finding a, a sample point there. And that's what we call a low discrepancy sequence. It's like you have a high probability in any given point of space of finding a point. Um, it, that's different from a pure random sampling, right? Because a pure random sampling might accidentally plump up too many points in, in a given spot. So this is more spread out than random, right? So that's why it's quasi-random. It's, it's trying to be almost random so that way you don't have to be on grid points, but it's not truly random because it's like, it's trying to get what the best properties of you know the best random run would be like if you accidentally had a really good random run that spread out your points as much as possible that would be your hypercube or, or the latin hypercube one of the reasons why people use sobel sampling for the points is um is because it's one where if you take uh, if you, if you take um you know one 1024 points uh, from a sobel sequence you can then ask it for the next 100,000 points, right? Um, whereas the Latin hypercube, you need to generate all of your points at once. And so you kind of need to know beforehand what, how many points you're going to do the integral on. Um, so, so the, the, you know, Latin hypercube gives you a, a, a sparser sampling and a better sampling of the space, but the Sobel method is re-entrant. So you can keep on asking it for the next terms, the next terms, the next terms. Um, it kind of gives a, a, a nice tiling of a large dimensional space, still without having curse dimensionality, but not with as much um, not with as much sparsity um, uh, as the Latin hypercube. So what you do then is you do Monte Carlo integration, right? So Monte Carlo integration is essentially this idea of you. These are the points that you evaluate the function at, right? So um, you, you want to do you want to do this expected value. So you want to do the expected value of f of x, right? This is equal to the integral of f of x um, dx, which you can then say is equal to um, the sum over i of f of x i um, times you know delta of x i. Well, where do you actually choose these points, right? Um, well, what, instead of choosing them on grid points because that's too expensive in large and high dimensional spaces, you you take these as the points that you evaluate the integral on, and for your delta x's, um, you use you 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 directly use a estimate of the um, of the total area, and you divide out the area at the end. So you know you you, you do this thing where you kind of divide out what the the area of the um, of the domain. Right, and this gives you then a formula for for this gives you a way to be able to do the integral um, without necessarily having to use grid points. So you know you can grab the points randomly, you can grab the points quasi randomly. There are many ways in in the literature for being able how to do such um, high dimensional integrals, but these quasi random numbers are a nice way to do it where you can get uh, good convergence. So if you just do a Monte Carlo method. Um, the convergence of this integration method is going to scale like one over square root of n, right? So as n goes to infinity, it will converge, giving you the correct um, 
Oh, so yeah, uh, you, you divide by um, n. Well, yeah, and there, there, I mean, yeah, you, you do an area estimate, which is dependent on n. Yeah, and, and what you then do is um, when, when you do the Monte Carlo method, you can show that as n goes to infinity, um, it does converge to give the correct estimate for, you know, for the integral, right? If you choose enough points, an integral is going to be good enough, um, but it scales like square root of n. And if you use some of these quasi, quasi Monte Carlo methods, you can show that the convergence of your integral estimate is by 1 over n. So you get asymptotically better convergence by using these kinds of sampling techniques. Now you can get exponential convergence, though, with a nice trick. And this trick is called Fourier Amplitude Sensitive Sensitivity Sampling, or FAST. And, but the method that people generally use in practice is the extended version of it, which is called EFAST, right? And, and the idea here is that instead of doing a linear decomposition, so instead of decomposing our function linearly into all these points that we add together, what we want to do is we want to do a decomposition into the exponential term. Um, and then you similarly define what, you know, so, so what I mean here by, this, by the dot, dot, dots is I'm saying that you know, f of x equals, you know, c, it's c1 exponential of 2 pi i um, m1 or mi xi and then plus uh, c i c j, right? So, so it's like what we did before. Um, I just wrote it in a in a much more compact syntax, but it's one of these things where we're now you know we're, we're doing something very similar. Um, or, oh, this is cij, except now our our functions are decomposed um, with exponential terms. So so we're 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 we're, we're no longer um, we're no longer just doing it as you know the linear combinations, but we're doing combinations of the exponentials. And why do we want to do this? Well, it's actually very similar to something known as a Chebyshev interpolation. Chebyshev, Chebyshev interpol interpolation. So, so the idea behind Chebyshev polynomials and Chebyshev interpolation is that you know that uh, you know that Fourier series converge exponentially. And so, what if you wanted to do a Fourier series of a non-periodic function? Well, you can do, you, you can define your polynomials, right? So, so let's say you want to do something on f of x, um, but you want it to kind of converge um, like it was a periodic function. So you can make it into a periodic function by using f of cosine of x, right? And you know, then you can say, I'm going to cut my cosines between you know, 0 and, and 2 pi, you know, or 0 and pi before, before I get this, um, before I, I, I get the everything coming back on itself. Um, and then you can do Fourier decompositions on f of cosine of 2 pi. And then now you have numerical methods that are, you know, it's, it's looking at a problem that wasn't necessarily uh, periodic, but it's doing the Fourier decomposition to get the nice properties of a Fourier decomposition, um, which are essentially the exponential conversions on, on, con on smooth functions. And this is where uh, the Chebyshev techniques come in. And essentially, what what uh, the Sobel trick that's going on here is trying to use that kind of Fourier decomposition trick to be able to get a a uh, a a Clenshaw Curtis um, so a it's known as a Clenshaw Curtis integration, which a uh, Clenshaw Curtis quadrature is using the Sobel points or sorry using the Chebyshev points um, to be able to get a Gaussian quadrature that has exponential convergence, right? Um, so, so what, what you, what you end up getting is if, if you follow the math is that, um, by Fourier series, right, um, you, you can, you can decompose all these terms into its orthogonal integrals. So it kind of requires a bit of Fourier analysis that I'm going to skip over. But, um, the, the key thing here is that you can find out all of these terms, the, the C's in, in the C's, which are the exponential versions of the terms, right? Um, in terms of the Fourier series, because they end up being given by the complex numbers. So if you can if you can find out the by Fourier series this a term and this b term, then you know all the c terms, which gives you this uh, this this decomposition, 
and you can define your vijs um, from the Fourier coefficients. Essentially, these are the energies, right? These, these are the energies due to the waves uh, with frequency i and j, and so this is a way to be able to go, to, this is just the conversion back from uh, Fourier space back into point space, right? So all you need to do is be able to calculate these a coefficient, or these a's and these b's in order to get your vij's, and then you have a very nice formula for um, for doing for getting these global sensitivities and and the the you know the percentage of variance in the output explained by given input. So why is this integral something that is so useful to look at? And it turns out um, that you can do this implementation by the ergodic theorem. Um, so so define right right so so here we want to do a very high dimensional integral right so an integral into 10 dimensions now we discussed how we can do can do that with you know sampling points using these quasi monte carlo spaces and that converges like o of n or o of 1 over n right um but we know that if you're to use something like a gaussian quadrature or a clenshaw curtis quadrature these one dimensional quadratures that are very, that are highly optimized um they converge at a much higher convergence rate. In fact, Clenshaw Curtis is exponential, right? So we don't want to be using these these sampling techniques unless we need to, because this will require so many more points to be able to calculate the integral. So is there a way to be able to calculate these integrals more effectively? Um, this is where we can use the the ergodic theorem. So I'm going, to, I'm going to prove this later, but essentially, let's say we have x sub j of s equals 1 divided by 2 pi uh, uh, omega sub j of s uh, mod 2 pi. So by the ergodic theorem, if the omega sub j are irrational numbers, then this dynamical system will never repeat. And here's an animation of that, right? So if... Um, so, so here's a way to think about it, right? So if you had this um, this wi sub wj as one half, and you started right here, and you and you were looking at what happened when you changed s, you would move up a bit, and then if if wij is one half, you reflect to the other side, you do this, and then you'd be right back on the same line you went to, right? Um, so if you have an, a rational number here, like one fifth. Um, the number of lines it would take to before you'd end up going back on the same spot would be five times. Um, if you have an irrational number, then it would take you infinitely many lines to ever end up back on the same line you had, and therefore you can cover the whole space with one line. Right? It's it's a way to be able to define one line. Um, and so here here I'm defining one line um, such that so so yeah. You, you need to have a wj or omega j in each direction, but if those omega j are irrational with respect to each other, then um, these lines, will you'll never have a line that goes over the same space um, a second time, and so you'll be moving through space in a way that essentially is sampling the whole thing, and you can show that this is a space-filling curve. So as you send s to infinity, you actually will hit every single point in the plane here. Trust me on this, I'm going to go back to prove the ergodic theorem in, in a little bit. So what this means then is that we can define an integral, right? We can define an integral over a very large dimensional box um, by a line that, that actually moves through every single point in that box, right? And if it's going to be hitting every single point with the same probability because it's moving through the whole thing, then... Um, what we can do is we can say we can use the limit as t goes to infinity of moving this line, um, moving on this line, and that is going the that that is a one-dimensional representation of this high-dimensional integral. Right now we just have a one-dimensional integral. We we just do the line integral on this line, and it just so happens we define a line that never overlaps on itself, and it's a space-filling curve. And so therefore, we can use all of our fancy one-dimensional integral tools. Um, now, we can't take the integral to infinity, so is there one last trick we can do? Well, we can say, 
Well, remember that if we if we choose the omegas, um, if we choose the omegas such that they are rational with respect to each other, um, then you will collapse back on yourself on that line. But you know the the lowest common denominator is the um, the lowest common denominator is the number of times that you will need to go around in order to finally end up back at the um, and end up back at the same point. So you can actually choose then, and you can say, well, if if I want um, if if I want to uh, you know if if I don't if I want to make sure that I, that I have like you know, 11 lines in here, then I can choose omega 1 equal to 11, omega 2 equals 7, right? So these are rational numbers, and so there's finitely many lines that I'll have to, to pal the space with, and therefore it's going to be periodic. So I actually only have to do it from minus, minus uh, pi to pi, because after that, this is going to be periodic. And, and, and so this gives me a finite integral, which gives me a nice one-dimensional approximation where I'm walking along this line and I'm doing the one-dimensional integral across this line. And these, inter these lines are kind of evenly spaced throughout um, the high-dimensional space. And then on this line, I can use you know, my standard one-dimensional quadrature methods that converge really fast in order to um, in order to compute these AMJ terms. So it, what you can do then is you can choose uh, combinations of the WI, WJs such that you have a higher period. And then when you have a higher period, then you have more filling of the space and you get a better approximation. But you can then choose how well you want to approximate. And it doesn't, and, and then once you've chosen your approximation, the integral can be done with exponentially less terms than the standard um, quasi Monte Carlo method. So what this lets you do then is it just lets you have a much more efficient method for computing the to the uh, the variant the variances and the total indices and all these terms. So let's uh, finish this by doing a proof of the ergodic theorem that if you are moving in different directions, irrational you know, with with periods that are ir irrational with respect to each other, then you will never have a line go back on itself. Um, so, so the proof is really to look at the, the just the one-dimensional case. So look at the map. Uh, the map that I'm looking at is x n plus 1 equals x of n plus alpha um, mod 1. Right? So l l let's first, first look at what happens when you have a rational number, right? So think about, the, think about this like um, you're doing rotations of a circle. And... Um, Let's say you're rotating by pi over 2, right? If you rotate by pi over 2, then um, when you go f uh, four times around, you'll, be, you'll have done 2 pi rotation, and you're back where you started, right? Pi over 4, then you know, in 8 turns, you'll get back to where you started. So it's 2 times you know, the, the denominator that is the number of times you have to rotate. Right? Um, what happens if you have something like uh, 5 pi over 2 as your... As your um, as your rotation, well, you then have to rotate, you know, if you rotate around four times, then you'll have, you know, so uh, four times five pi, then, then you'll have a rotation of four times five pi over two, which is equal to, um, which is equal to, to, to do uh, 10 pi, right? Which you know, ten pi. You know, if we're doing this in rotation space, it's mod two pi. Uh, so this is going to just be equal to zero again, right? So um, this this shows you that you know, if if you have a rational number like five pi over two, there is a number of rotations that you get back to zero. And once you get back to zero once, you can always find out how to get back to zero just by doing more rotations. So if alpha is you know, if the rotations that you're doing is a rational number of two pi, then you are then you have a finite period before you end up in the back in, in the space where you where you started right um that's essentially what's going on here right so if you think about this as, instead of rotations but you're kind of like moving along and then once you get to 1 you go back to 0 you know this is kind of like ro rotations divided by 2 pi um and so you know if you choose a a, a rational number for alpha that that you're moving up by you know, then it doesn't matter where you start. Let's say you start at one third. 
um, and alpha is one quarter. And if you add one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, you know, then you will have moved one around and you'll be back at your starting point. Didn't matter if that starting point is one third, didn't matter if that starting point was pi over three, right? That is true for every starting point. Four times or four, four applications of the map will then get you back to your starting point if alpha is one half, one quarter. If alpha is five quarters, then four applications will still send you back, right? Um, you'll, 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 you'll have gone through the loop more times, but you will still get back to the same, the same place you started with after four iterations, um, because then you'd be at five, at five at extra points, but then mod one, it'd bring you back down, right? So what we then want to prove is that, um, if it's irrational, right? So think about like if you do by square root of two, then you never actually hit back at that at that point you started at. And if you never hit at that point you started at, we might be able to prove that 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 this map that you actually get is dense in the space of zero to one. And what I mean by dense is, um, if you take this map out far enough, you can find a point that is epsilon close to any other point. So, um, so okay, so so this this is the the irrational rotation map that corresponds to the problem we're thinking about above, just the one dimensional version of it. What we want to sh prove is that in any interval i, there is a point in our orbit that goes in that interval, right? So, so here's what I mean, right? So you you have this whole line. Now let's assume that alpha is irrational. What I want to prove is that if I take any interval, um, then there is a point, there is a time going forward where x, you know, there is a time going forward where the next, where this point is going to be hitting inside of that interval, and that's true for any inter interval. So what do I do? I say take an interval i. Uh, let's find the number of iterations or let's let's prove that um let's prove that a point you know, x of i ends up in this interval for some i right and the way that we prove this is by contradiction by contradiction so assume a finite epsilon such that no two points are um are are epsilon are so assume a finite epsilon such that no two points are epsilon apart, right? So assume that uh, assume that there's an interval. So let, let's say we had an epsilon, right? And our assumption here is that there are no two points that are closer to each other than by epsilon. Uh, let's show that that gives us a contradiction, right? So um, this means that there's a spacing between epsilon. Uh, this means that uh, there's a spacing between all of our points by at least epsilon, which means that in this space we have at most, so therefore we have at most, um, here I write 2 pi over epsilon, but that's for the rotation problem. Here we have at most 1 over epsilon many points, right? So if we say that points are, no, are not any closer than 1 quarter from each other, then we have at most four points in our space, right? Um, uh, that means that our, that our orbit has to be periodic, right? Because that means that we only have finitely many points. Um, so, be, so that means, so that, so that means we have finitely many points, right? Uh, because we have one over epsilon points in the map that, that, that show up in our interval. So there must be, there must be a p such that x sub n plus p equals x sub n, right? Because we only have finitely many points before we end up hitting a point we had before. Um, so now let's actually look at what the map would do to that. So, so what that would mean is that, um, so what that means is p times alpha, right? So um, p applications of alpha equals one, right? Because um, what that means is that, you know, you, you should be able to, you, you know, so, so if you subtract out on both sides here, so, so, with, so uh, you know, x of p, x of n plus p minus x of n equals zero. And so um, what, you, what ends up being this extra term here is, uh, 
you know, so this is x sub n plus uh, p in p alpha, uh, which equals zero, which equals, you know, mod one, right? So this is, this is the nice case of mod one. So what that means is then that we have that alpha equals, uh, or p equals one divided by alpha. Which means that, you know, th th this, this integer or the integer for how many times it takes to go back around and hit the same point is equal to one divided by alpha. But if we assume that alpha was irrational, then we would have a contradiction because this is an integer. So uh, what, that, what that means is that, so what, what this means is that there is no epsilon such that all points are more than epsilon apart, right? Because if that was true, if it was true that all points were epsilon apart, then, well, we'd end up in this contradiction because if, if, if all the points are epsilon apart, then we only have finitely many points. Therefore, we have a periodic um, we have a periodic map, and if we have a periodic map, we can use the period of the map to derive um, to derive a contradiction, right? That you know, one divided by alpha has to be an integer, but it can't be an integer if it's irrational. So this means that there are no point th that there's no epsilon such that everything is spaced out by more than epsilon. This means that points must be you know, if you if you look in any interval, there must be points there because they have to always be clo as close as possible, right? So, um, so, so for every epsilon, there must be um, two points which are less than epsilon apart, right? Otherwise, we'd have this contradiction, a contradiction to this term, which, which we know. So let's go back to taking... Um, now let's go back to this proof of that there's a point in the in this interval, right? So so uh, take any um, arbitrary interval i and let epsilon be less than d over two, where d is the length of the interval between um, for every epsilon. There are, um, there must be two, must be two points less than epsilon part. So, so then that what that means is that th there is a x sub uh, x sub n plus m and x sub n plus k, such that the difference between them is less than epsilon, right? So assume without loss of generality, assume without loss of generality that m is greater than k. It just makes the, the proof a little bit easier, but you, know, you can always redefine your point such that one would be the other. So without loss of generality, let's make this assumption. Um, so what, what this means is that um, m minus k rotations, right? So if we have a point here and then we have a point here, then uh, in, in some future thing, if we changed our initial condition to this point and then we did m minus k iterations, we would end up at this point, right? So M minus K ro M minus K rotations, you know, if we if we rotate M minus K times, that is uh, that is a rotation which is uh, less than epsilon, right? Because it's bringing us from two points that are epsilon apart. So then we can do you, you know, so M minus K rotations is a way to do a rotation that is that is inside of this interval. So now we can now we can do m minus k rotations 
j times, right? So every single every single time we do m minus k rotations, we move over by something less than epsilon. And if we do this, you know, enough times, if we do this enough times, we will hit, we will have to be inside of every single interval that is of size epsilon because we're moving by less than epsilon, right? So, um, so because we, because we're doing this, there, uh, so there must be a j such that j times m minus k rotations brings us into um, the interval i. So therefore, there must be a rotation. So therefore, uh, for every interval i, there is a rotation, a number of rotations or number of applications of our map um, that brings us into interval i. So it doesn't matter what interval you, you choose or how small of an interval uh, on 0 to 1 you choose, there is a point in the future you know, so if alpha is irrational, there is a point in the future such that x sub k is inside of that interval. It doesn't matter what interval you choose. Right? So that's what we've that's what we've proven now. Um, so what that what that means is then that our that our our um, rotation map is dense, right? Because that that means that it, you know, uh, how do you prove that you get epsilon close to um, to the, this random point, we'll take an inter, put an interval around that point, um, that it, where that interval is size less than epsilon. There is a number of rotations that it gets into that interval. So that, therefore, you found a point, you found a number of rotations that is going to be less than epsilon away from that point. And that's true for every positive epsilon, um, for every point in zero to one. And so, if 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 alpha is positive, that means we essentially get you know, infinitely close to every single point as long as you bring this um, th this map out far enough, right? And that's how this thing works. That's how this thing works. That you know, we we've chosen an irrational mapping such that uh, such that this periodicity for how we're hitting back at this line is you know, it's going to be it is this kind of map. It's this it's this map right here where this alpha is the is the ratio between the two different w's or the two different omegas and so if we made that alpha be something that is um, irrational then you will hit every single point in this space at least once and then all of these lines are just constant slope and so therefore we will fill the entire space of this square and that's that's the proof, and so this gives us a nice way to be able to do really high dimensional integrals and turn them into single dimensional line integrals. And then, well, what if we want to cut it short? Well, we just make this alpha be a rational number, and then we will repeat at spots in this line, and that repeat that repeat tells us how much computation we need to do, and 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 so that gives us the approximate method. So it all is, is a really nice application of the ergodic theorem, right? Because then we end up with just one-dimensional integrals, and we can use these Clenshaw-Curtis methods to get exponential convergence of the integral um, by, by integrating just along these weird lines. So this is a very long introduction to global sensitivity analysis, but it shows that, you know, there's so many different methods you can think of where a local sense, of, you know, just using a linear approximation over the whole space is the easiest way to think about it. But you can go all the way deep into using the ergodic theorem to give you these special lines on which you're, you know, doing an irrational um, one-dimensional integral over high-dimensional space to be able to give you the average value for how the function changes. So hopefully that's a very enlightening uh, talk and. Um, if there's still a lot of research that's going on in the space of global sensitivity analysis, so for example, can you do an ergodic theorem type of approach to be able to do the second, uh, second, the Sobel second indices, right? Because it's uh, with with this method, the eFast, you can get the first indices, so you can get how much the variance changes with respect to given variables, and you can get the total indices, so how much in total is the output changing with respect with respect to variable i, but you can't get the um, the combination terms. You can't get how much does the output change with respect to you know changes in in i and j together, right? 
Um, and so there's still a lot of research going on in these types of methods. Um, but you can see that a very simple question of how do things change on average can get very deep and, and very mathematical fairly fast.